that was covered and the area was secured, so I'm not sure if that was a physical type injury or a non-physical injury. And Dr. Loya, what was your experience with the people that you were looking at? Um, when we first arrived, our chief concern was to find out which patients were most critically injured and to get to them and to give them emergent treatment and to prioritize their transport. When we arrived, we saw about 20 people on the ground wounded, uh, many others that were walking wounded around the place, and uh, most of the people down on the ground, uh, actually all of them, were suffering from penetrating injuries, some to the uh, neck, uh, chest, abdomen, uh, extremities. Life threatening? Um, so the penetrating wounds to the chest are always considering are always considered uh, critical uh, and serious. But all of the patients were awake and alert and answering our questions. And they all appeared to me that although their injuries were critical, that they would survive their injury. We did come across one patient who was on the ground with a white sheet draped um, head to toe. We couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman or how old, but it appeared that they were fatally uh, wounded or they were um, dead. We had one report of a heart attack. Did you see any other fatalities there? We just saw that one body with a sheet over it and the police were not allowing us to uh, go near the body. What about the, uh, what about the emotional impact on the people who were superficially wounded or those who weren't hurt at all? Were they pretty traumatized? Actually, the only people in the area that we had seen were the patients themselves uh, the task force, fire department, health care providers, and there were no other spectators. The area was completely sealed off, and people that were injured were very calm because they had many uh, assistants calming them down. I, I just thought that the uh, police force, the firemen, the paramedics did an excellent job. They were very organized throughout the whole uh, time. They never panicked. They were very polite to everyone there. They, uh, cleared away all the bystanders. The bystanders were very cooperative. I thought the whole situation was um, handled commendably. Dr. Waya, Dr. Khan, thank you very much. Thank you. Modern American heroes, of course, in these great cities are the emergency room physicians who can respond so swiftly and know how to deal with the trauma of the kind that we have witnessed. It's now just after 6 in the morning Eastern Time. For those of you who are just joining us, it has been a long night and a long nightmare in Atlanta, Georgia. You are looking at a map of downtown Atlanta. The highlighted area is called Centennial Park. It was to be a place of celebration and joy for the thousands of people who came from all over the world to celebrate the Olympic Games. At 1.25 this morning, it changed into a scene of horror. You're now looking at our graphic representation of the various Olympic venues and where Centennial Park fits into all of this. It was to be the enduring legacy of these games, a gift, if you will, to the city of Atlanta to revitalize the downtown. And that tower was the epicenter, if you will, of an explosion that occurred this morning at 125. We believe it came from that leather satchel that was at the base of a tower that came, contained lighting and sound equipment for a rock concert. Police were clearing away people when the explosion occurred, and this is what happened. That was the explosion. It was a tremendous force. 110 injuries altogether were told by the FBI, including several police officers who at the time were in the immediate area because they were trying to clear the tower and clear the people away from the base of the tower. You'll see them on the ground here. Two people confirmed dead, one of them a heart attack, had a coronary incident at the site and then died of a heart attack by the time he got to Grady Memorial Hospital. Four Atlanta area hospitals were mobilized to deal with those who were hurt. And many of them have been treated and released so far. And then there was an announcement that the Olympic Games will go forward, but the flags will be lowered to half staff, and there will be a moment of silence. Here is the news conference from the International Olympic Committee and the Atlanta Committee on the Olympic Games. First of all, the games will go on. I repeat, the games will go on. As I speak now, 
everything from the operational standpoint is ready. Buses are rolling, the athletes have been notified, and the games today will go on. Francois Carrar, who is the representative of the International Olympic Committee, and as we look down now at a live picture of Centennial Park, as you can see, it's quite serene, but it masks, in fact, the trauma that has happened to the city and to the spirit of these games. Let's hear now from Woody Johnson, who is the FBI agent in charge of this investigation. At approximately 1.25 a.m. this morning, uh, an explosive device uh, detonated in the Centennial Park uh, downtown. As you are also uh, should be aware, uh, that is a public park, an open area that can be visited by uh, any of the people that are here for the Olympic Games. Uh, it is not a secure venue area. Uh, Woody Johnson, who described this as an act of terrorism, he says the FBI is taking the lead in the investigation, plainly an explosive device. The conclusion uh, at the beginning is probably that it was some kind of a pipe bomb, which is a, cl a crude instrument, but it can do, as you saw tonight, great damage to people who are in the immediate area, especially when it's uh, set up next to some kind of a metal structure because it damages that. It causes shards of metal to fly, and a lot of the people who were hurt, in fact, took that. I want to share with uh, our viewers now, if I can, the U.S. Red Cross hotline, or helpline as they describe it, for families, and only for families, if you will, please. If you have questions about family members who are here and you have not heard from them, this is the number to call, 404-685-8285. That's the number to call, 404-685-8285. NBC Sports' Jim Gray is outside the headquarters of the Committee for the Olympic Games here in Atlanta, and he has some additional information for us now, Jim. All right, Tom, we have some uh, additional information to uh, pass on to you right now uh, uh, concerning ACOG workers and staff. Uh, uh, we're told by the people here at the Inforum building where the uh, Atlanta Centennial Olympic Games uh, operation uh, takes place out of that uh, workers should call in. Right now the building is closed and uh, many workers do have to get into the building here uh, within the next hour or two. And right now the building is entirely shut down. So uh, you might want to call. There are some people of uh, some authoritative position who are in place. Uh, and if the games are to go on, of course, this staff will have to get into place and they'll have to get into place right inside here. Now, another uh, problem that is a potential big problem, Tom, is that uh, for the past 23 hours now, many of the policemen, security officials that we have spoken to have been on duty. In, fa in fact, the special task force has uh, been up uh, since uh, 7 a.m., got a one-hour break, and uh, now have been all day. And this has been going on, they say, for the past couple of days because they had to protect President Clinton so that they were pushed to the limit, uh, particularly the Atlanta Police uh, Department, in protecting him uh, uh, upon his trip in which he visited gymnastics and uh, swimming, uh, which was uh, yesterday. Uh, now, they are not going to be able to get a break, so you're going to have a very tired police staff uh, working uh, throughout the night. Uh, we are also told uh, at this time that uh, uh, relatives, uh, they are trying to contact uh, some of the relatives uh, uh, and get in touch. And uh, Roger O'Neill and uh, Sarah James from NBC News have a little bit more uh, on, that, uh, on that story. Well, you're, you're struck, Jim, by, by Centennial Park and the openness of that park. And, and the FBI emphasized that this was an open area, open to all. It was the festival part of the Olympic Games for Atlantans. It was the place they could go and experience the feeling of these games if they didn't have the tickets to any of the venues. That's why it was open. Atlanta officials wanted it to be that way. They wanted that festival atmosphere. We've walked through it hundreds of times, going back and forth from the International Broadcast Center. There is no security there. I mean, there are police officers on the street looking, but, but it is nothing like the venue if you've been to that, going through the magnetometers and having all the bags checked. But that was by design. Does that now appear to be something that, that should have been reviewed, or, or is it bad design? I mean, it, it, what it basically comes down to is you cannot protect every street corner, be it 100,000 people or six people. That's right. That, that's ab absolutely correct. And do you want to make the Olympic Games a prison? I mean, do you want everything so controlled that you get the feeling that you're in prison? Obviously, that's not what Atlanta wanted. Now what those police officials are having to do is to sweep that entire Centennial Park, or as as they say, sanitize it to make sure there are no other explosive devices in the park. And it bears mentioning that police say they have received no other threats.
Now, Sarah, if you're a family member or you have uh, some friends who may have been involved in this, uh, you have some information as to what uh, they should do. Well, Tom was pointing out that what they have said is for family members and family members only to call that Red Cross hotline. That's very important. I was struck earlier, Jim, by, by two scenes. One was a young man and a woman who were sitting on a street corner. You know, this was a wonderful evening. People were having a great time before this happened. And here was this young couple, and she had her head buried in her hands, and he had his arm around her. And they had been with friends right in front of the stage, and they hadn't seen their friends since. So you have this image of a wonderful evening that has all of a sudden been torn asunder. The other image is of watching a man make a phone call, and he was shaking. And he was saying to his wife on the phone, it sounded like fireworks. At first, I thought it was fireworks. And I'm sure we've heard that now from many, many people. The sound of that explosion, which we just heard, was incredible. And he said he could feel the debris falling onto his arms from, from this explosion. So I think that it's important for people to be calling their loved ones, because not everybody can call that Red Cross number. So it's important for people to reach out and call those who are their family and friends so that they know that everybody's OK. Sarah, Roger, thank you. It, it brings to mind one, one further point. In being fortunate enough to uh, have gone to several Olympics, uh, I can remember in Seoul, Korea, where we had uh, training staff so coming down off buildings and, and machine guns and, and all these type of training exercises that went on uh, to protect the games in Seoul. And we all kind of looked at everybody going in with machine guns as a very militaristic society and a very militaristic games. Didn't see any of that here in Atlanta. In fact, you don't see anybody really with any weapons other than policemen. Also in Albertville, uh, you were struck by the people who were actually living in the snow underneath uh, the splendid Alps there. They would be underneath the snow ready to guard just in case uh, of something like this. Here in Atlanta, in Centennial Olympic Park, you would see some police, but you didn't see anything like that. Uh, not to suggest that that was something that should have been done, but simply to say that in other games and other places, there was a much greater militaristic uh, presence. Tom? Thank you very much, Jim Gray. And of course, uh, we can be grateful tonight that the police were able to get people back from the site of the explosion. As much as they did, they did have a couple of minutes warning or it could have been so much worse. We have an affiliate partner in covering all this and that's WXIA. Mike Landis has been taking the lead throughout these long hours. Mike, what do you have for us now? Very interesting, Tom, to show you how quickly things can change. This was the picture on the front page of the weekend edition of USA Today, Amy Van Dyken winning a fourth gold medal. The headline had to be changed, however to blast hits Olympic Park. Quite a shame and quite an unbelievable event. As a matter of fact, my co-anchor and I, Angela Robinson, were walking away from uh, the park, probably a block and a half away with our crew of about six people when we heard the explosion. Angie, what's, you've been down there. You and I got separated during all of this, and I came back to the station. Tell me what's Mike, going on. Mike, as you know, it was about, what, five hours ago when this terrible ordeal happened. We are right out here at Techwood and Baker. Um, the whole area, the park area, is cordoned off. It's closed. Traffic is moving down here. Buses, cars, people going to and fro on this very early Saturday morning. But the park is closed off. Earlier tonight, we got natural sound and reaction from people right after the explosion happened. Let's roll that tape. <laughs> safety we're asking your leave no. park is closed right now i don't know if they had shrapnel wounds or whatever but i saw stuff coming over the fence leave the park you need to leave the park well i know three people that were down and they had like people you know standing over them and as soon as the car bomb went off or whatever it was went off the police told everybody to get out of the park and there were people that were standing over top of the ones that were down and one of them was a cameraman inside the stage um, shrapnel and sparks set up in the air and some, uh, some clay, grass, and, uh, and then and it was a real deafening sound. It really hurt my ears bad. And then the next thing I knew, people were running around and screaming, and they were telling everyone to get out of the park. I saw this big light, you know, and of course I heard the explosion as well, you know. And you know, all the glasses on the shelves, you know, was, were knocked over, and they came on me, but I didn't get cut. I was kind of lucky. And I didn't get hit, but someone standing right behind me did. And my wife and I, and I want, I want to show her. I mean, we, 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 we put this person on a bench, and we made sure that they got an ambulance. I mean, that's, a, that's what happened. As you've heard incredible stories, you saw all of the emergency crews here. Kim Barnes, my colleague, is here with us. You were in the superstore when all this happened. 
Well, that's exactly right. Photographer Chris Davis and I were inside actually shooting a story on something different. We heard the explosion. Everyone just 